love this church because uh, we're not afraid to admit we don't have it figured out. I also love this church because we love feeding hungry people. And we do that, like Donnie talked about this morning. I love this church because, like Donnie, we have a passion for the next generation with Shine, with kids, with Unleashed. This church has a passion for the next generation. And I also love this church because here, lost people matter to God. If you walked in, this, in those doors this morning, you have no clue what's going on. You have no idea if you even want to learn anything about Jesus. You have no idea what you even think about him in the first place. If you walk in those doors, you matter. It's a place where you matter. You've come to the right place. You matter to God. He loves you. Therefore, us as a church, it would be completely remiss of us, a mistake on our part, to do anything different and value you any different or less than God does, right? And I think we know that. Okay? At Revolution Church, lost people matter to God. People who don't have a relationship with Jesus matter here. I think we're good at that. I don't just think we know it. I think we're good at it. But I want to extend and stretch that core value a little bit this morning, if you'll let me. We're in the middle of this series uh, where we've talked about how in Christ we have a new name, where we have a future, where we have hope, right? But if we're honest with ourselves this morning, if we're honest with ourselves, Even though we know those things are true, we feel like we've lost our way. You feel like you're trying as hard as you can to bring these kids up and make sure that they know that you love them. You're trying as hard as you can to work with diligence and excellence at school or at your workplace. Your family's a mess, but hey, you're trying to be consistent. You're trying to be a loving presence. You're trying to be faithful to your spouse. And with all of that, with all of that, you're trying to find the purpose and the joy that you had at your salvation. But all of it just seems just out of your grasp, just at the edge of your fingertips. I can't quite reach it. I can't quite get there. You have a relationship with Jesus, but if you're honest, you still feel lost sometimes. And I want you to know this morning, if that's you, that you still matter to God that he has not abandoned you, that he's not finished with you. And some of you, that's all you needed to hear. You can walk out of here right now saying, you know what, I know that I matter to God. I know that I matter in this place. I needed to feel validated that there was purpose for my life. And if that's for you, please stay for the rest of the message because that would make me insecure if you walked out right now. But some of y'all, that's what you needed to hear. But I'm hoping that this morning, you'll leave ready to face all of those challenges that are in your mind and that I said with a new resolve and a new perspective. Okay? We're going to be in John 14 this morning. If you want to open your Bibles up there. And while you're kind of turning there, um, I'm going to pray. Father, thank you so much for just the uh, ability to be in your presence this morning. Lord, we thank you that we have the ability to sing, hallelujah, you've won the victory. Hallelujah, that you've won it all for us, God. And I pray that in this place this morning, people would believe for the first time that you won that victory for them. And God, those of us that have believed that in the past, that we would believe it again. Lord, I pray you show us something new about ourselves and new about you this morning. Use me as your broken vessel to deliver what you have for people to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, we're gonna be in John 14. um, But before we dive in, I'm kind of gonna give us a little bit of context. I'm gonna set the stage a little bit, set the scene. I'm gonna Jeremy Brackett, a.k.a. Brandon Peavy that mug. You know what I'm saying? Those guys are here every Saturday at 5 o'clock. Y'all give a hand for them too, because... They're here every Saturday at five o'clock setting it up, and that was the worst joke ever, but I told Brandon people I was going to shout them out this morning, so I did. Um, So I'm going to set the stage for what's kind of going on in John 14 by reading everything that had just happened. Not reading everything, but going over what happened in John 13, okay? So in John 13, Jesus had just washed all of the disciples' feet. The craziest, coolest, nastiest, if we're honest, act of service ever, Okay? It was a radical display and portrayal of what true leadership looks like, to humble oneself by serving, right? And right after that, Jesus and his disciples had what we now call the Last Supper. He broke the bread and poured the glass to signify his body and his blood that was going to be broken and shed for them. And I think this is so cool because right back to back, he he washed their feet to signify he wasn't too big to serve them But then by breaking bread and signifying his crucifixion, he articulated and later displayed that he was big enough to save them. Come on, that's good. Jesus, Jesus wasn't too big to serve, but he was big enough to save. And because Jesus was that way, 
because he wasn't too big to serve, but he was big enough to save. If he's big enough to save, we're not too big to serve. Amen? So he's just done, Jesus has done miracle after miracle. Every miracle you can think of in your mind that Jesus has done outside of him healing the ear of a servant and him resurrecting himself has happened up to this point. He's served them, he's broke bread with them, he's just predicted his death and resurrection. He's allowed Judas to leave to go and betray him. And so we know that this is literally pretty much the swan song of Jesus that we're stepping into. And I point all that out to say to the disciples, who Jesus was, was solidified. Okay, it was, it was established. They'd had multiple experiences with Jesus, even just moments before this, for them to know the character of the man in front of them. So what Jesus is about to say, the foundation and the framework of who he was, and even their relationship with him had already been established. At the end of John 13, Jesus predicts that Peter is going to deny him. Peter's like, you crazy man, we besties, I would never do that. But then he, he does. We know Blake always gives me a laugh. Even if nobody else does, Blake's going to laugh. I appreciate it. Hashtag courtesy. Laugh. Blake Glover. Not Davis, everybody else. Her last name is Glover, not Davis. If anybody's confused about that this morning. So, um, anyways, where was I? Peter was denying. He said, I'll never do that. But we know, ultimately, right, that he went and he did that. He denied Christ three times before the rooster crowed, right? And some of us this morning were caught in the same cycle that Peter was. We've seen God, we've experienced him, but when we get outside of that moment, it's hard, it's scary, and we feel rudderless, directionless, lost, ultimately. We can't find our way. And I hope this morning we can find a way to break that cycle. John 14, verse one, says this. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the place to where I'm going. Jesus is establishing the fact that he's about to go to heaven and the disciples have finally deduced that that means he's gonna have to die right? And he's comforting him by saying, listen, yes, I'm going to heaven, but you're going to be with me. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't fret. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. Matter of fact, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, he says later, which will be better than me being here. And if I said I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm a man of my word. I'm going to go to prepare this place. I wouldn't be preparing this place if you weren't coming. We don't prepare our house. Sometimes we barely clean our house if company ain't coming, right? But if they are, better believe that mug better be clean or mama's gonna get mad, students. Clean your room. That's a caveat, right? Amen, parents? Clean your room. Whether your mom, your dad, your grandma, your me-ma, your mama, your mama jamma, whoever tells you to clean your room, you clean it. They ask you to do that. I just got brownie points with all the parents here. Yeah, they're like, man, I like that guy, student pastor. I'm really happy he's uh, over our students. Um, but anyway... Um, Jesus is saying, I'm preparing a place for you, right? You've surrendered your life to me, so your spot is secure. When we surrender our lives to Jesus, our spot is secure. When we, you surrender, your spot is secure. When you repent, your place is prepared and permanent. When you repent, your place is prepared and permanent. That's alliteration for the decades right there. That's good. Richard, give me a hand clap. Appreciate it. But these disciples, and Jesus is able to say this to all of these disciples because Judas had already left, right? That all of these disciples have declared Jesus as Lord, assumedly, probably. They've declared him as Lord of their life and therefore their spot is secure, their place is permanent and he's going to prepare it. Jesus is preparing them a place. If you have a relationship with Jesus, to tie that in, if you have a relationship with him, he's preparing you a permanent place that cannot be taken away. He's saying, you've been with me. You understand. You know the way. But then in verse, th in verse 5, Thomas responds and he says this. It says, Thomas said to him, uh, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? 
and, and Thomas kind of gets a bad rap. Doubting Thomas, there he is again. But Thomas gets a bad rap because I think that about 90% of the time, just about every single one of the disciples was thinking what Thomas wasn't scared to say, right? Lord, uh, we don't know. We don't understand. Would you re-explain that to me, please? But how many times have we thought that and not said it, right? Whether we've been afraid or we think the Lord's going to reprimand us or take us out of his kingdom, we forget that our spot is permanent, we think we're going to lose it somehow. We think but we don't say, Lord, I don't understand where you're going with this. Sometimes we do say that. Lord, I don't understand what you're doing. What are you doing? Please just help me see a little bit further along the road, please, God. That'd be great. Then I'll feel at peace. Then I'll be able to take care of my family. Then I'll be able to do this. If you just show me a little glimpse of where you're going, then I'll be able to do what you're asking me to do in this moment. But the Lord is saying, believe in God, believe also in me. Believe in God, believe also in me. The NLT translates it this way. Trust in God, trust also in me. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? So Jesus answers him in verse six. He says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There's no other way through which to come to the Father except through him. Jesus establishes the Trinity in this moment, right? So there's no doubt. If you know me, you know God. There's no mutual exclusivity here, right? Jesus is fully God. God the Father is fully God. God the Holy Spirit is fully God. He's the way. There's no other. But we have become obsessed with creating our own way. We've become obsessed with creating our own way. We've become obsessed with being the person who has a way. We've become obsessed with the per to being the person who has a plan. They're obsessed with being the one or pretending like we're the one who always has all the answers. So much so that we don't listen to what other people say because we already got it figured out, to be honest. So I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying right now, but I ain't, gonna, I ain't gonna change anything because you have nothing to say to me that I don't already know. We don't go to life group because really what are they gonna teach me anyway? I don't need people. I got this figured out. And they wouldn't be able to speak into my situation anyway. They wouldn't understand where I'm coming from anyway. They wouldn't really know what's going on with me anyway, so why would I go? Because we have it figured out. We've got our own way. We've got our own way. And on the flip side, a lot of times, we won't even reply to a text. We leave it unread because we don't have the answer right then in that moment. We wait until we do have it. A day later, a couple hours later, whatever it is, we don't answer the phone because, hey, I don't have an answer for your question right now, so I'm going to leave it, uh, uh, let it go to voicemail. If I don't hit uh, deny, then it'll go to voicemail. They'll just think I missed the call instead of uh, I denied their call and I went to voicemail. I've done that. Okay? And we think, we think because we, f we function that way, Okay, we think because we function that way that in some weird, twisted way, God needs our suggestions for how to do things. We're so obsessed and used to having control that we forget at the end of the day, we really don't have any. We become so obsessed with being in control that we forget at the end of the day, we have none. It's kind of like when you're learning how to drive, and that's why I have this set up here. You're learning how to drive, okay? You learn how to drive, and your mom is over here, and she's pressing as hard as she can on that brake pedal, and she can't get you to stop no matter how hard she tries. And, and so much so, by the time you're actually like able to drive by yourself, your buddies get in the car, and they're like, bro, what's that hole in the ground? I can see the tarmac. I don't know what you're doing on the tarmac, because that's where airplanes go, but hey, I can see the ground. You're like, man, I, 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 I don't know, but hey, I got a car, bro, let's get out of here. But your mom in that moment, right, she's trying as hard as she can, she's trying as hard as she can 
to take control of something that ultimately she just can't, right? Even if she reaches over and jerks that steering wheel, most of the time it does more harm than good, right? But then there was that one time where she grabbed it and it got you out of a situation and it looked like, oh, hey, see, that's why I'm here. I'm your mama. I'm your mama. If, if I wouldn't have done that, you'd have crashed in the back of that semi. Mom, I saw the semi. I just braked a little bit later than you wanted me to, okay? And I'm not, at least that's how it was for me. That's my mama. I love my mama. She's great. And I'm not here to, to dog, okay, students, I'm not giving you the excuse to not listen to your mama when she's telling you how to drive, okay? And I'm not dogging on worried mamas because I had one and they're great. And a lot of times they get you out of the trouble they're trying to, okay? But don't miss this point. God is in the driver's seat and we're in the passenger seat. And here's the deal, guys. God's a competent driver. He's good at what he does. He's been God a long time. He knows what he's doing. But we get in the passenger seat and we think, he doesn't see what I see. He doesn't see this semi coming at us, right? He doesn't see what I see. But the reality is, he sees so much more than we do and can. We can see the car right in front of us, but he can see the whole road. There's no, there's no other way, there's no other way that's going to satisfy that's not his. And in some ways, that feels infuriating. I want to drive my own car, please. I want to be in the driver's seat, please. Most of the time we don't say please. But I want to drive my own car. I want to be in charge of my own life. I want to be in control of what's going on. So just, if you just would let me, maybe I can reach the pedal from this side. My mom tried to do that one time. It's a true story. I'm really a great driver, I think. I don't know, ask Heather. She might say something different. But it's infuriating, right? And if it's really, really infuriating to you, you're probably used to having control. You probably enjoy having control. But if you just lean back, sit back in your chair, instead of continuing to reach for the steering wheel, you'll feel yourself start to calm down. You'll feel peace begin to wash over you and you'll actually start to enjoy the ride. Not that the circumstances in front of you are going to change, okay? That wreck that's off to the side that's making you move slower than you feel like you should is not necessarily going to be removed in that moment. But when we let him take control of what he's already driving, when we let him take that control, there's this overwhelming sense of peace that washes over you. That frustration you used to feel about not having control turns into relief because you begin to see God for the first time actually as trustworthy. And then we'll be able to sing with confidence what we sang this morning. We surrender all to you. Come have your way. Do what you want to. You say, well, that's all well and good, AJ, but uh, uh, you don't understand my circumstances. You don't understand there's two semis sitting in front of me and, and there's an exit I could get off of right here. If God would just give me a sign, like detour ahead, then I would understand right? But for now, I'm going to hold as tight as I can to the steering wheel until I see something different. Thank you very much. Let me show you what happens next in this passage. Verse 8 says this. It says, Philip said, Lord, just show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work, his work. And Jesus had just said all of this, right? He had just said, if you know me, you know the Father. And right after Jesus declares this unity between him and God the Father, Philip replies with, uh, Lord, just show us the Father. And here's the kicker, guys. Then Jesus says, have I been with you? Have you been with me this long and you still don't know me? 
That's a tough question right there. Here it is right here, y'all. Some of y'all have been walking with Jesus for a long time and you still don't know him. You've been walking with Jesus for a long time and you still don't know, it, don't know him. Some of y'all have been walking with Jesus. Maybe you have a relationship with him, maybe you don't. But if you're being honest with yourself, it's not his way by which you're living your life, it's your own. Are you living your life by your way or his? Are you living your life by your way or his? I'm not just talking about messing up here and there, okay? We all make mistakes. Like I said, this is the church where our poop stinks. If you smelled something when you walked in this room, it's probably how jacked up we are, okay? But I'm talking about you know and you have sensed before in your life. You may have even said it before, but then you didn't change anything. But you've sensed before in your life that your life is not run by or submitted to God. It's ran by and submitted to me, myself, and I. Thank you very much. I have a better idea of what's going on. But here's the deal. Jesus said he was the way, and that meant that you are not. He said he was the way, and that means that you, that I am not. I'm saying that this morning with passion because it's something that I need to hear, okay? I'm not saying you, 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 you. I have problems with wanting to grab the steering wheel all the time. Jesus said he was the way, and that means that we are not. The way that we design, guys, is gonna fall short. The way that he designs is unbeatable. The way that we design is really no way at all. It's us grasping for the steering wheel when we have no business driving. We ain't even got a license. He made a way. He made a way. He made a way when there was no way. He didn't follow the path, guys. He made the path. He created life. Don't you think he has a better idea of how to live it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it, I get it. Sure, 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 sure. Cool, 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 cool. Heard that before. His way, his way. Got it, got it. Totally, got it. Cool, 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 cool. I've heard that before, AJ. I got laughs on that, so I did it again, totally. Um, anyways. Um, but let me give you an example, okay? When I was a senior in high school, okay? And take this for what it's worth, okay? Because there are multiple other times in my life where this has happened, so don't write this off if you're an adult. And I'm talking about high school because you'll be able to see how it applies to you if you listen. When I was a senior in high school, I played football, basketball, wished I would have played baseball, hashtag regrets, but I was, part of a, I was also part of a competitive, creative, problem-solving performance team. And I was dating this great girl, uh, at least I thought she was. My senior year was supposed to be balling, y'all. It was supposed to be awesome. I was featured in a Texas high school magazine as a player to watch. But then after grades came out and a bunch of people transferred out of our school, instead of going eight and two and deep into the playoffs, we went two and eight. It was great. It was awesome. It was awful. Um, and then as soon as football was over there, I was like, it's okay, it's okay. I got basketball, man. We're going to be good in basketball too. We're supposed to ball out. They kind of just let me play because I was a good hustler. I really couldn't do any of that, okay? But we were ready to go deep into the playoffs there too. But instead, we ended up losing 10 games by five points or less. And four or five of those was in overtime. Like, oh, and we missed the playoffs by one game. If we'd have won one of them things, we'd have been in the playoffs. Missed them. In the middle of those two things, my performance team was, if we would have gotten third place at our competition, instead of fourth, which we got, we would have gone on to global finals for the third straight year. We were pretty good. And in the middle of that, my great girlfriend broke up with me in a text message on my birthday. <laughs> and it was just one thing after another, right? Get out of here. Um, peace, be gone. Your breath is mighty strong. But... I don't know. My worlds, my worlds were crashing down, ultimately, okay? And I remember getting in my car after that last basketball game my senior year, just so angry. I was, I was ticked, y'all. I remember getting in the car, driving, and just yelling at God at the top of my lungs, God, why? Why does everything I care about fall apart? Why don't you care about me and what I care about? What's the point of even trying if you're just gonna make everything fall apart? Why does everything I put effort into not seem to matter to you? And I was driving and shouting, which I don't recommend. But as I begin to calm down, I remember thinking, this is the first time I've talked to God in a long time. 
outside of, Lord, please let me drop 20 points tonight or let me make an A on this test I didn't study for. That was about the only conversation with God that I had. And it was like this wave washed over me of I'm complaining about all of these things to God with whom I have a relationship in which I've stopped putting forth any effort. Matter of fact, I really have never put forth any effort. And here's the deal, y'all. I went to church. I was there every Sunday and Wednesday. But I was bitter. I had a lot of church hurt. We went through youth pastors like toilet paper. Seriously. I had no consistency. My church was political. My church was a lot of different things. They were also doing great things for the Lord, okay? But I had taken all of that anger and bitterness at God's people thinking they weren't worth my time and I had translated it without even thinking about it to God as if he wasn't worth my time either. I definitely don't think time with him would help. Some of y'all literally, as soon as I'm talking about spending time with the Lord, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard that before, AJ. I heard that. Spend time with the Lord. I'm not going to do that. What's that going to change? Nothing. I spent time with him last week and then nothing changed. I would scoff at people that said, hey, read your Bible. It'll change your perspective. I would scoff at them. (laughs) Whatever scoffing looked like when I was 17. And guys, in, in this time, I had received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I had been baptized, okay? But my relationship with Jesus was not a priority in my life. I had a relationship with him, but relationships take effort. I can tell you guys all day that I'm married to Heather, right? That I love her, that I've committed my life to her. And you would have no reason to doubt me, ultimately. But if Heather and I get outside these walls and all I do is ignore her and run the opposite direction and we never spend time together, intentionally, guess what's going to happen? We're going to go further and further apart. And it's not that we're not married, right? Right? It's not that we're not married, but when the relationship isn't intentionally sought after, the intimacy disappears. The closeness dissipates. When your relationship with the Lord is not a priority, the intimacy disappears. The closeness dissipates. Ooh, the Holy Spirit's in here right now. When your relationship with the Lord is not a priority, the intimacy disappears, the closeness dissipates. You're saying that your way to figure things out is better than his, that you have a better way. But I promise you that the Lord's way is better. And the only way to dive into his way is to dive into his word. The only way to dive into his way is by diving into into his word. And it feels so trivial. It feels like the churchy answer, right? It feels wrong, ultimately, if we're in a place of bitterness. That's not right. That's not going to help me. But if I'm asking God for answers and I don't look where he put them, do I really want answers or do I just want to complain? He has a way that will blow your mind, a way that will transform your perspective, a way that will make the things that seem big become small, make the chaotic things become peaceful because you'll see that he's in control. I can lean my chair back. I can enjoy the ride because he's in control. He's in the driver's seat that I've been trying for a long time to get into because I didn't trust him. Going all the way back to verse one, it said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Guys, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you've submitted yourself to a Lord, the authority of a Lord that does not want your hearts to be troubled. But the only way that's going to happen is if you trust him and trust that 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 is his intentions. If you trust him with your situation, And trust doesn't mean throwing your hands up in apathy or throwing yourself a pity party, but by seeking him in his word and in prayer. Not just one time in the middle of your trouble, but through it all. Like the song says, in order to say through it all it is well, we have to have gone through it all with our eyes on him. 
Through it all, my eyes are on you. Therefore, through it all, it is well. Through it all, it is well because through it all, I've kept my eyes on you. 